So last class we introduced the notions of uh, magnetic attraction and repulsion. We introduced um, magnetic south poles and north poles to help us understand magnetic attraction and repulsion. Uh, that like poles repel and unlike poles attract one another. We also introduced the notion of magnetic fields as carriers, conveyors, mediators of magnetic forces uh, between um, uh, magnetic poles. Uh, at, towards the end of the class, we introduced our first equation on magnetism. That equation on magnetism was the field equation. It's the equation that quantifies the magnetic field that carries the magnetic force, like the field equation for electricity quantified the notion of the electric field that conveys the electrical force. In today's class, I'm going to start with a short topic of the field equation again. The field equation we wrote in the last class as the, um, in terms of the force on a moving charged particle. I'm also going to introduce a second version of the field equation, where it's the, um, the magnetic force on an electrical current. So that'd be the first topic. And then we're going to work through three examples involving uh, magnetism, involving um, uh, magnetic forces, magnetic torques. These are classic examples, famous examples of magnetism. We're going to look at the um, uh, circular motion of a charged particle in a magnetic field. That would be one topic. We're going to look at the um, deflection or the force on a straight wire, current carrying straight wire in a magnetic field. And then finally, we're going to look at the um, rotation of a loop of wire, current carrying loop of wire in a magnetic field. So most of this class is about some illustrations, some examples, some applications of, um, of magnetic interactions uh, involving moving charged particles, involving electrical currents. Okay, so the field equation for magnetism. It's the equation that specifies the force in terms of the, um, the mag magnetic field. We wrote it down last class. I want to um, show you another way that it's written down, because there's actually two ways that it's written down. Sometimes you use one way, sometimes you use the other way. Um, one way involves writing it down in terms of thinking about a single moving charge particle. Uh, the other way involves thinking about uh, a current, a flow, of moving charged particles. So those are the two different ways. The, the key point here on this slide is that electric current is the flow, motion, movement of electrical charge. So if a moving electrical charge experiences a magnetic force when in a magnetic field, which is what we met last class, then it must be that a collection of moving electric charges, which is electrical current, also experience a magnetic force when that current is in a, electric current is in a magnetic field. So if a moving charge experiences a magnetic force, then a electrical current will experience a magnetic force. And we're going to write the, um, the, the field equation in terms of both the, the the moving, single moving charge, and a um, electrical current. So that's the next slide. Here it is. So here is a section of wire, cylindrical section of wire in, in light blue here. And it's immersed in some magnetic field in green here. The, this magnetic field is heading into the screen, into the overhead. And there's a current flowing along the length of this wire, from the left to the right. So here's the direction of the current. And of course, we understand that that current, if we could peer into that wire, look into that wire, we'd see that current 
as many electrons, billions and billions and billions of electrons streaming along, drifting along the length of that wire. So that current is shorthand for a collection of moving electrical charges. And because that collection of moving electrical charges are in this magnetic field, they're going to experience a magnetic force. The wire overall is going to experience a magnetic force. This equation here is the field equation for a single charge, Q, moving with velocity V in a magnetic field. We met that. This is the new field equation. This is the equation for an electrical current I in a wire of length L in a magnetic field, and it's the magnetic force on that. So these are two versions of the field equation. One's appropriate when you're thinking about a single moving electric charge. The other one's appropriate when you're thinking about an electrical current flowing down a wire. Um, it's worthwhile to think about the QV in the single charge equation and the IL in the um, electrical current equation. So these are the two pieces. The QV and the IL are kind of what experience, what feel the magnetic force. So they're the bits that what we, we would say couple to the magnetic force. They're what experience, what feel the magnetic field. Um, they both have the same units. They're just different ways of thinking about motion of charges. So the units of QV is coulombs times meters per second. It's the product of charge and velocity. The units of current times length. Current is coulombs per second. Length is meters. So this, too, is coulombs meters per second. So that helps you remember or remind you that really that they look like they're very different things, IL and QV, but they're really the same, the same quantity that's feeling or experiencing a magnetic field. It's just in one case you're dealing with one moving charge, the other case you're dealing with many moving charges, and so we have a different language of the charge's motion versus the electrical current. Both of those quantities, QV and IL, that experience, that feel magnetic forces, both of those quantities have a direction to them. So um, the velocity obviously has a direction to them. The particle was traveling from left to right, for example. The current also has a direction to it. The current was flowing from left to right. So they also have that directional feature, which is important in determining the direction of the force in the field. So when we talked about the direction of the force on a single moving charge particle, we introduced that right-hand rule. And when we talked about the force on an uh, electrical current, there's also a right-hand rule. And those two right-hand rules are really very similar right-hand rules. We're just replacing uh, our, our use of the velocity of a single moving charge with the current of an uh, assembly or collection of moving charges. So when we use the right-hand rule for currents rather than a, a single velocity, let's take a look at this picture here. So here's a current that's flowing left to right in some magnetic field that's sort of going into the screen. And we would want to find the force, the direction of the force, based on the direction of the current and the direction of the magnetic field. The way that we would do that is point the palm of our right hand in the direction of the current flow. So rather than the direction of a single moving charge, now it's the direction of the current flow. Uh, it's the direction that positive charges would be moving in. It would be the opposite to the direction that negative charges would be moving in. So it's the direction of the current flow that's from left to right. We would then curl our fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is heading into the screen, into the overhead. So I curl them into the screen, and then my thumb will point in the direction of the force. So in this particular case, using that right-hand rule with this hand as the current, my fingers curling in as the direction of the field, I get a force that's upwards on this wire, on the um, moving charged particles in this wire. So in a sense, it's really the same right-hand rule. 
we're just replacing current with velocity or velocity with current when we think about collections of moving charges versus a single moving charge. Okay. So, so now we're just moving on to um, three different illustrations of um, the effects of magnetic fields on uh, either a single moving charge or an electrical current. And they're three important cases, three important examples. Uh, the first one is that a single charge in a uniform field actually undergoes kind of perfect circular motion. So it's a very important, interesting feature of uh, a charge's movement in a magnetic field. It executes circular motion. So we're going to try and understand that. Um, I think the first thing I'm going to do is show you, yeah, show, I can't show you the, the a, a complete circular motion of a, um, a charged particle like an electron, but I can, I can show you how we get a curved motion that you could imagine becomes a circular motion for a charged particle in a, in a, ma in a magnetic field. So I'm going to uh, switch on the camera, I think. What you see on this screen and what you see here is a, is a tube. It's an evacuated tube. When I switch it on, what's going to happen is that we're going to create a, a beam or a stream of electrons, charged particles, that stream across from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the tube. So we're creating an, a, a current, a collection of electrons streaming from the left-hand to the right-hand side of the tube. And, and through fluorescence, you'll actually be able to see these electrons as they're running from the left to the right. And then I'm going to bring up a, 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 magnetic, uh, a magnetic field by bringing up a bar magnet. And we're going to see the um, deflection, the curvature of the electrons in that, in that magnetic field. I'm going to set the mood. Um, it's too early to open the bar at the back, but I will set the mood. Um, <laughs> that's the lunchtime class. Um, OK, so th this is amazing, really. Here you're literally seeing these electrons as they're streaming from the left to the right um, through this evacuated tube. You're seeing it through fluorescence inside the tube. Now, I should have shown you this first, but here's the magnet. And if I bring up the magnet, you see I'm deflecting, I'm curving the path. I've got the north pole next to the magnet. And now if I bring up the south pole, I'll curve, I'll deflect the path in the opposite direction. And so if we had a big enough magnet, big enough magnetic field, I could, and a big enough tube, I could make these electrons literally go in a circular path with that magnetic field. All I'm showing you here is that they will go in a curved path, but we could make them go in a circular path. What was? It was hard. I don't know if it was hard to see in the back, but I, I, I didn't see a difference from the back. Oh yeah, I realized it didn't show up very well on the um, on the screen. So it, if you're at the front, you probably saw that the electrons without the magnet were just streaming left to right. And then when I brought up the magnet, um, if I brought up the, the the north pole, they kind of curved down towards the ground. And if I brought up the south pole, they um, kind of curved up towards the sky. And so I'm showing you the beginnings of curvature, which you might imagine, nobody saw this, could become a circular path. So that's what I tried. I should have looked on the screen. I thought it would show up properly on the screen. It didn't show up really on the screen. Yeah. It really was just an excuse to turn the, turn the lights out for a moment. And, um, and now I've forgotten what I'm doing. Uh, 
OK. So here we're going to show that if we were able to put those electrons or charged particles in a uniform magnetic field, we'd actually create a perfect circular motion of those charged particles. So um, over here on the left is the sketch of that circular motion. And over here on the right, I'm calculating uh, the features of that circular motion. So if we look at the sketch on the, on the left-hand side, firstly, I've got a magnetic field. It's indicated by these green crosses that's heading in towards the screen. So this is a region of uniform magnetic field. I've got a moving charged particle. Here it is. It's executing circular motion. Uh, in this magnetic field. And I've indicated at, at various moments around this circular path, uh, over here on the, on the far right, over here on the top left, and uh, over here at the, the, the bottom here. And so this is the circular motion that arises from a charged particle moving in a uniform magnetic field. How does it arise? So that's an interesting question. It arises because of the magnetic force. And it arises because the magnetic force provides a centripetal force. And if you've got a centripetal force, you undergo circular motion. So for example, let's imagine this moment here when the charge is on the far right. Its velocity is straight upwards. The magnetic field is into the screen and so that there is, by right-hand rule, there's a force directed towards this point here. So there's this force in, in, in blue here. At the bottom, now let's imagine the point at the bottom. Point at the bottom, the, the charge is moving now from left to right. It's moving in a field that's in towards the screen. And so at the bottom, the force is directly upwards. It's this force here. And wherever we calculate the, um, the direction of the force based on the direction of the motion in this magnetic field, for example here, we would find it also points towards this common point. So this is the magnetic force providing a centripetal force. A centripetal force acts towards the center of the motion. Centripetal force changes the direction of the particle and causes it to move in a circular path. So this is qualitatively how that centripetal force arises. We can figure out the details of the circular motion based on that understanding. So let's do that on the, on the right-hand side here. So the key idea is that we've, we, we've got this idea that this, that this magnetic force on this moving charged particle in this uniform field is going to provide a, um, a centripetal force. Let's go with that. Let's say that that force, Fb, the magnetic force, equals that centripetal force, Fc. That's what I started with upstairs here. The magnetic force is providing the centripetal force. I then substituted in a pair of equations. One was the equation that tells me how the magnetic force works. That's the field equation. It's Qv times B times sine theta. But here, sine theta is sine 90 with 1, so I just dropped it. So that's the magnetic field equation that I plugged in to describe the magnetic force. And then on the other side of the equation, the left-hand side of the equation, I plugged in the, the equation you met it in physics 211. It's the equation for uh, a centripetal force. It depends on the size of the circle, the speed you go around a circle, how heavy the object, how massive the object is going around the circle. It's mv squared over r. It's this guy here. And then I just did a little bit of algebra. A little bit of algebra that led me to two equations. One equation for, was, is for how fast the particle orbit in a circular path. The other one, so that's in meters per second. The other one is kind of, second equation, also kind of how fast it orbits, but not in meters per second, in radians per second. So how many radians per second does it cover? So this one here tells me the relationship between the velocity of the circular motion and the radius of the circular motion. It's just got from this equation upstairs here by canceling out a v. 
and then multiplying by r divided by m. That's all this you have to do to get this equation. And this is a classic equation. It tells you the relationship between the, the velocity of the circular motion and the radius of the circular motion for a charged particle, here's the charge, in a magnetic field. So any charged particle in a magnetic field with any charge Q, any mass M, in some magne uniform magnetic field B will undergo a circular motion with this characteristic relationship between um, the velocity of the circular motion and the uh, radius of the circular motion. You see, the greater the circle radius, the greater the velocity. So as you pump up the radius, you're going to be pumping up the uh, velocity, or, or vice versa. You shrink the radius, you're going to shrink the velocity. It has a very interesting consequence. Angular velocity, so that's radians per second, or degrees per second, or complete revolutions per second, is equal to the linear velocity, v, divided by the radius of the circle. So if I was to just divide this equation by r, on the left-hand side, we get the angular velocity. And we would have lost the r on the right-hand side. This equation says a very interesting thing. No matter how big or small the circle is, the orbit is, whether it's a giant orbit or a small orbit in this uniform magnetic field, the angular velocity, the number of radians per second, is always the same. It's because if it's a big circle, the, the, the charged particle is going faster. If it's a small circle, the charged particle is going slower. So the angular velocity is always the same. It also means if angular velocity is the same, it means the time taken for one complete lap, one complete orbit, that will be the same. So whether you've got a, a small, your particle going around in a small circle at slow speed or a big circle at high speed, the time taken for one orbit, one complete orbit, one period, that's going to be the same. And that time taken for one orbit, one complete orbit, or the angular velocity just depends on the properties of the particle, the charge and the mass of the particle, and the field that you've immersed it in. So it's a very, very important equation. Okay, so that's circular motion. Um, this is what I couldn't show you with this, this particular tube. This is a, a large volume vacuum tube you're seeing a picture of. Electrons are directed into the large volume vacuum tube, just like we directed electrons into this tube. This is immersed in a uh, uniform magnetic field everywhere over this tube. And here you see more than we saw. We saw the curvature in a magnetic field, so the electrons started to curve downwards or curve upwards. Here you're seeing the, this kind of beautiful circular path of the electrons that they, as they revolve around, they orbit around in this, um, in this uniform magnetic field. And as I say, what's going on here is that there's a perfect balance between the centripetal and the magnetic force provided in the centripetal force, and there's this characteristic angular, freq angular uh, velocity or period or frequency of these uh, circular orbits, these revolutions, which is determined by the nature of the particle, its charge and its mass, and the field that you've immersed it in. This is actually how the Earth's magnetic umbrella, the Earth's magnetic field, saves our lives, this circular motion. What happens with that deadly cosmic radiation that we're all worried about now? What happens with that is when it enters into the magnetic field, it starts undergoing circular motion. And it undergoes circular motion. And circular motion kind of traps those charged particles. They just keep going around in a circle, and they don't drop down on our heads. So that magnetic field of the Earth is trapping the charged particles in circular paths. And, and here's sort of a, a picture of how it works in details. I, I'm not going to explain exactly how it works, but here's the Earth. It's a magnet. Here's its magnetic field in, in green. Here's the North Pole where the field lines come out. Here's the South Pole where the field lines go in, the magnetic North and South Poles. 
the charged particles, here's a charged particle, look at it spiraling around perpendicular to the magnetic field. So this is not a uniform magnetic field, but you get the same kind of effect. In fact, these charged particles spiral around the field lines, and then they bounce back, they spiral back. And this one's spiraling around and will bounce back, and so on and so forth. And so above the Earth, above the Earth is this great umbrella of charged particles that have been collected there and prevented from coming down and streaming down onto us. And so that's, that's how we avoid the cosmic radiation. The northern lights, I don't know if you've seen the northern lights, um, the northern lights are created by these charged particles. And these charged particles hidden, you know, ions or um, uh, atoms in the atmosphere and seeing the fluorescence. This is exactly the fluorescence that we saw basically in this tube or in the previous photograph of circular motion. Here's a quick question, a quick problem to work through on this. Um, in, in this particular problem, we've got a particle with charge 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, a mass 2.5 times 10 to the minus 26 kilograms. So it's, 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 it's an ion. It's some sort of ion, singly electronically charged ion with some mass that's appropriate to an ion of some particular atom. And it's, um, firstly, it's accelerated by a 250 volt potential. And that's the straight line part here. This is the electrical acceleration. And then it gets magnetically deflected in a region of magnetic field. And that's the circular part here. And based on all this information, this information up here boils down to being told the charge of the particle, the mass of the particle. That's the characteristics of the particle. That's the Q over M we were talking about, about a particle. In addition, we're told how much we, um, the electrical potential over which we accelerate the particle. And then we're told the magnetic field that we immerse the particle in. And, and based on all that information, we're going to find the, um, the, um, the radius of the orbit. If you want to think about this problem from a perspective of energy, that initial electrical acceleration is like the particles being allowed to roll down or slide down some electrical potential hill. So imagine some skier or, or whatever, just, just sliding down an icy hill. So that's the, um, that's the um, electrical acceleration from that electrical potential hill. Then, at the bottom of the hill, it enters a region of magnetic field and just goes around in a circle. Just goes around in a circular path. And we're going to find the, the radius of that circular path by first actually calculating the speed that it enters in that um, region of magnetic field. So, so that's the plan. So here's my, um, here's my sketch. Um, over here is the charged particle initially, Q over M, Q and M. Those are its charge and its mass. This straight section here is the electrical acceleration. Uh, in that straight section, it loses electrical potential energy. So it is initially at the top of an electrical potential hill. It loses that as it slides or rolls down that electrical potential hill. It acquires kinetic energy. If you can't read this, this is kinetic energy. Once it's acquired that kinetic energy, once it's acquired that speed, it then enters the region of magnetic field. This is this circular path. And this is where that magnetic field is providing a magnetic force, and so it undergoes circular motion. During that whole circular path, its velocity doesn't change. Its kinetic energy doesn't change. Its velocity is what it inherited from the electrical field. Its, its kinetic energy is what it inherited from the electrical field. So I'm going to solve this problem actually in two steps. The first thing I'm going to figure out is the velocity 
of the charged particle the moment it enters the magnetic field. This is the velocity at the bottom of the potential hill. Imagine it, it's this a little charged particle, it's skiing down a slope, and it's acquiring speed, it's acquiring kinetic energy by giving up um, potential, electrical potential energy. So we're going to find that V by thinking about energy. And then we're going to finally, we'll, we'll find R by thinking about the uh, circular motion in the, in the magnetic field. Given that we know the speed of the circular motion, we'll be able to find out the velocity of the, um, sorry, given we know the speed of the circular motion, we'll be able to find the radius of the circular motion. Okay, so there was a lot of words, sorry. Kinetic energy equals potent, potential energy. What I mean here, I mean that the initial potential energy was turned into final kinetic energy as we went down the slope, as the charged particle went down the electrical potential hill. Um, I can turn that, in, that idea, concept, notion, into a useful equation for us. The final kinetic energy is one-half mv squared. The initial potential energy, that's the initial potential, or the potential difference, times the charge of the charged particle. So this is, this is an old friend. This is QV. This is an equation that we can rearrange for V in terms of things we know. I can multiply both sides by 2. I can divide by mass. I can take the square root. And so that will tell us the velocity. So based on the notions, ideas of energy conservation and trans transforming potential energy into kinetic energy, I can find the um, velocity. I won't put in all the numbers. We wouldn't be able to read it. It's um, uh, 57,000 meters per second. So that's the velocity. So actually, seems a little unfair. This was nothing about magnetism, that part of the problem. It was all about uh, electricity and what we did running up to test, test one. Um, but now we can use some, we can work with some magnetism. So what we learned was that in this uniform magnetic field upstairs here, we're going to undergo circular motion. And there's a characteristic relationship between the um, speed of the circular motion and the uh, radius of the circle that you um, uh, travel in, orbit in. It's this relationship here. We just met it. So V is the speed. R is the radius of the circular motion. Those are the characteristics of the circular orbit. Q over M, those are the characteristics of the particle, the charge and mass of the particle, and B is the field that's needed to make the circular motion. We know, in this case, the speed. We want to figure, in this case, the radius. So I just got to rearrange this. So to rearrange it, I'm going to um, multiply by M. I'm going to divide by Q and B. And so this is the radius of the circular motion, which I can calculate because I know the velocity of the circular motion, and I know the properties of the particle, its charge and mass, and I know the magnetic field. Again, I'm not going to plug in all the numbers because we wouldn't be able to read them. It'd take me five minutes to do it, and it'd be all a nightmare. Um, so I'm just going to um, look up what I previously calculated. It's 1.77 centimeters. That's the radius, 0 0.0177 meters. And so we've been able to calculate the radius of the circular path of this moving charged particle. Um, this setup that I've just described is what's called a mass spectrometer. So one day, or you might have already used the mass spectrometer, it's how we measure the masses of tiny subatomic particles like ions of atoms. So the way you measure the masses is you accelerate them with an electrical field. We did that here. You then bend them, curve them in a magnetic field. We did that here. You measure the radius of the curvature, although we calculated that here. Based on your measurement of the radius of the curvature, you can calculate the mass. So this is not just some, you know, oh, I'll make up some stupid device that we can, you know, bend been charged particles. It's actually how we measure the masses of ions. It's how it's done. Okay.
let's uh, move on. Let's move on to the deflection of a straight current carrying wire in a magnetic field, or um, uh, the uh, force on a straight current carrying wire in, in a magnetic field. Where am I going? OK, maybe I'll, I'll show you the deflection first. So here I've got a wire, and it's part of a circuit. So there's a wire around the back here, and it's connected to this power supply here. And there's a switch in the circuit here. So the switch is open right now. It's actually a, a reversible switch. So I can, if I move the switch to the left or right, I can change the direction of the current from clockwise to counterclockwise through, through this wire here. This wire is immersed in a magnetic field. So here's a big, powerful magnet made of iron, uh, magnetized iron. Here's the North Pole. Here's the South Pole. Imagine, imagine you could see these field lines that are streaming out of the North Pole and being collected by the South Pole. So that's what's going on here. So this wire is literally immersed in, bathed in that magnetic field right now. Right now, there's no current in the wire. If I was to switch on the circuit by closing the um, switch, suddenly there's a deflection of the wire. There's a force on the wire. That's a magnetic force, a magnetic deflection on the wire. It's pushing the wire into the magnet when I close the switch towards the, the left-hand side. If I close the switch towards the right-hand side, that's going to drive the current in the opposite direction. Let's see what happens then. So then we get a force in the opposite direction. Now the, now the wire is being pushed out of the magnet towards you. Again, that's a magnetic force, a magnetic deflection due to a current in a magnetic field. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. <clears throat> OK. So, so here is a picture of all of that. And I've got two pictures like this in which I want to introduce kind of the, the right-hand rule for this current in a magnetic field so that we can understand why the wire was deflected into the magnet or away from the magnet, towards you or away from you. So in, in this particular overhead, uh, I've, got a, um, I've got a region of magnetic field here are the little crosses that represent this, the code for a field that is uniform, because the crosses are you know, evenly spaced. Importantly here, this field is in towards the screen, in towards the overhead. Then I've got a, a current, a current that's flowing up the wire from the bottom to the top. Now, that's a current, uh, an electrical current that's going upwards. If this is a, you know, the wire itself is made of electrons, negative electrons, positive ions. If this, like a typical metal wire, the electrons are in motion and the ions are stationary, the uh, negative electrons would be um, streaming down the wire. The current is up the wire. That's the conventional way we define current, which means that the electrons, the negative charges themselves, are streaming down the wire. So those electrons are moving down the wire through a perpendicular magnetic field, they'll experience a, um, a magnetic force by that um, field equation, F equals QVB sine theta. So the individual electrons experience a magnetic force, but also the current, the current which up is up, experiences a magnetic force. Um, it just represents a collection and assembly of moving charges. And um, so the, the current will experience a magnetic force that's given by F equals uh, IL B sine theta. The direction of the force, we could find one or two ways. We could think about individual electron, what's the direction of the force on it, 
or we could think about the direction uh, of the force by thinking about the current. So let's start thinking about the current. So the current is going upwards. So I put the palm of my hand upwards. The magnetic field is going in towards the um, uh, screen. So I curl my fingers in towards the screen. And my thumb is pointing towards the left-hand side. So the force on the current is towards the left. So the right-hand rule for the field equation, F equals ILB sine theta, tells me that there's a force on the current towards the left. If we were to think about the electrons, on the other hand, the, the electrons are going down. So I curl my fingers, point my fingers downwards. I curl my fingers in towards the screen because the magnetic field is still in towards the screen. My thumb points towards the right, but that would be the force on a positive moving charge particle. The electrons will experience a force in the opposite direction. It would be towards the left. So the electron, individual electrons experience a force towards the left as they move downwards. The current overall, experience, of course, experiences the same force towards the left because it is simply that collection of electrons. Here's the case if we reverse the current. So if we reverse the current, it was going up to a current going down. We're also reversing the direction of the electrons. They were going down, and now they're going up the wire. If you reverse the direction of the current, or you reverse the direction of the moving charge particles, you're reversing the, the direction of one of the ingredients in the right-hand rule. So the current was going up. Now the current is going down. The field is still in towards the screen, but now if I use the right-hand rule for the current, my thumb now points towards the right. So because we reverse the direction of the current, we've re reversed the direction of the force. It's now towards the right. And likewise, if we were to be thinking about the electrons, the electrons are now going up. The um, field is still in towards the screen. My thumb points towards the left, but that's the direction on a positive charge. The electrons are negative charge, so they would experience a force towards the right. So now they're also individually forced towards the right. So um, the point of these two slides is uh, examples of using the right-hand rules for single moving charge particles or currents overall. Also, the point that if you reverse the direction of the motion of a charged particle, you reverse the direction of a current, but leave the field the same. Don't change the field, which is what we've done in this situation. We change the electron direction. We change the current direction. You're going to change the force direction. So that explains why we had the wire move away from you towards you, into the magnet, away from the magnet, when we changed the direction of the current. The field was the same. The field was unchanged. We changed the direction of the current from, from the left to from the right, and we changed the direction of the force to, towards you, away from you. OK, let's look at a, a quick example uh, involving quantitative example involving the force on a um, long straight wire. So in this particular example, we've got a circuit. Here's the circuit. Simple circuit. It's like a battery upstairs here. And here, one terminal, the positive terminal, heads down here. This is a flexible wire over here. Uh, hanging from that flexible wire is this metal beam or rod here. And then the current flows up this second flexible wire here. So that's the entire circuit. And so that there's some current that's flowing through this rod. If you were to set this up at home tonight in your kitchen, and you adjusted the current, you could adjust the current, its direction, and its size in such a way to make that rod float in your kitchen. So what we're going to imagine is that we've changed the current, the direction it's flowing in, the size of the current. And so we've got this condition where the, the rod is just floating there. That would mean that there's no tension in the flexible wires on the left-hand right, right hand side. They're not, they're not helping support it. The rod is simply floating there in, in the Earth's gravity. The question is, what current, for what current will that rod just float there in, in space, in, in the Earth's gravitational field? So let's see if we can figure that out. OK. 
Okay. So here's the problem. I, I started solving it by drawing a diagram. Um, here's, I just sketched the rod because that's the important point. That's floating in the Earth's gravitational field. So here's the rod. Uh, we know something about the rod. We don't know its mass, we don't know its length, but we know the mass per unit length. I wrote that mass per unit length as M over L. So we were told that that quantity is um, 0 0.04 kilograms per meter. So every meter of the rod, if it was many meters long, would have a mass of 0 0.04 kilograms. We also know the field that it's been immersed in. The field that it's been immersed in is a, is a field that is um, uh, 3.6 teslas. And so here in my sketch, I'm sketching the field. So the little crosses, right? They're the uniform field that have immersed the rod in. And um, so that's the B field. And then I'm sketching the forces that are acting on the rod. And the key thing is here that this rod is in equilibrium. This rod is just floating there. If it's in equilibrium, if it's just floating there, it must be that the magnetic gravitational force downwards on the rod, it's pulling it towards the Earth, is being balanced by a magnetic force that's pulling it upwards. So it must be that gravity and magnetism are in perfect balance. They're the same size forces, but they're opposite direction forces. And so I kind of drew that here. It's hard to read, but this is FG, and this is the force arrow representing the gravitational force. This is FB, this is the magnetic force. Here's the force arrow representing that. And I'm trying to draw that they're equal and opposite. They're in equilibrium with one another. Okay. So the equilibrium will allow us to find the current. Because as you change the current, right, you would change the size of the magnetic force. And so there's a special current that creates equilibrium. Also, the direction. With one direction of the current, you'll actually get a downwards magnetic force. That won't help you balance. The other direction, you get an upwards magnetic force. That will help you reach equilibrium. And so firstly, let me just say, um, what is the direction of the current in this wire? To do that, I can use right-hand rule. I'm just going to um, note this over here. We know that the, the force is upwards. So in right-hand rule, this is the magnetic force. That would be my thumb. The uh, field is in towards the screen. That would be the direction I would curl my fingers. So is the current going towards the left or right? So to figure that out in this sketch here, I would, let's just try it out. Let me try putting my hand towards the right. That would be the direction of the current if it was flowing from left to right. Uh, I'm going to curl my fingers in towards the screen, like the magnetic field, and that gives me a force that's upwards. So it must be that the, um, the current is going from left to right. If I did the reverse, if I tried the reverse, I put my fingers uh, going towards the left, so the current's going towards the left, and then I curve my fingers in towards the screen. I mustn't do it like this. I've got to do it like this. Then I would get a force that's downwards. So that's not the right direction. The current is flowing from the left to the right. Um, what on earth did I do with my pen? <laughs> so here's the direction of the current. That was the right-hand rule. That's, that's part of our answer to the problem. What's the direction? Okay. So now we need to know the size, and that's just based on this idea of equilibrium, that, that now the magnitudes of the two forces, gravity and magnetism, are the same. Uh, I can fill in how magnetism works. This is the field, no, that's, this is gravity, how gravity works. This is the field equation for gravity, basically, that G is the gravitational field, and M is the thing that couples, feels, experiences the gravitational field. So that's the gravitational force, field equation. And then here is the... Um, magnetic case. This is the field equation for magnetism. In this case, the field is in towards the screen. The current is left-right, so this sine theta is sine 90, which is 1. And so we've just got this equation that mg, the gravitational force, equals ILB, the magnetic force. We can rearrange that, right? 
for the unknown. The unknown is the current. I just got to divide through by um, L the, uh, and B. And if I do that, what do I get? I get M over L times G over B. So that's the rearranging of the equation. Um, I wrote it, it's not a very good G, is it? Well, it's not a very good M, L, or B either, all right. Um, but anyway, um, here, I wrote M over L, and I put them in the little parentheses. Why did I do that? I did that because I'm remembering, I don't actually know M. I don't know L, but I do know M over L. So they were crafty, whoever wrote this problem. They were trying to trick us to think we were going to know the length of the wire. We're going to need to know the mass of the wire. We don't need to know the mass or the length of the wire. We just need to know the mass per unit length, which is this thing here. So we were given this in the problem. And then here's the acceleration of gravity. Um, this is the gravitational field. Here's the um, uh, magnetic field. This is the B field. So it's the ratio of the two fields that create the two forces. If you plug in all the numbers again, I won't plug them in, I got 0.11 amps. And so that was my solution to, to that problem. Okay. Last topic. Last topic is um, a loop of wire immersed in a current carrying loop of wire, not a current carrying straight wire, current carrying loop of wire immersed in a, in, in a magnetic field. Uh, so let me show you a demonstration of that. I'm going to take my magnet and I'm going to bring it over here and place it here. Here's a loop of wire. It's actually many turns, many loops of wire. And we're going to sit the magnet between, below that so that there are magnetic field lines that are coming out of the North Pole, streaking over towards the South Pole. So this loop of wire is in a magnetic field. Now, right now, there's um, no current that's flowing through that loop of wire. But, of course... I've arranged for that loop of wire to form a circuit. So here's part of the circuit. Uh, here's the switch that's in the circuit. Again, this is a reversible switch. I can push the switch towards you or away from you to change the direction of the current through the red and the black wires. And then I've got a power supply. And so I'll switch on the power supply. And then we'll see what happens when we, when we close the switch. So I'm going to push the switch towards you which would be one direction of the current around the loop of wire. And look, we get a magnetic twist, a magnetic torque that turns the loop of wire. And it turned, if you looked at, I'll do it again, think about the direction. This end on the right moves away from you. This end on the um, left moved towards you. And now I'm going to flip the switch in the opposite direction, so away from you. And now it rotates as a magnetic torque, a magnetic twist again. It's turned the opposite direction, though. Now, the left-hand side has moved away from you. The right-hand side has moved towards you. And so here we're seeing that there's a... So it's not so much of a force, although we understand it ultimately in terms of forces. The deflection of the wire, that was a force, a push towards you, away from you, or to the right or left. This is a torque. This is a twist. This is a turn a magnetic twist or turn that we're seeing. So let's see if we can try and understand this. Okay. So to understand this, I've got a couple of slides. I've got one slide where we think about the forces acting on a loop of wire. And then those forces in general create torques, rotations. Next slide, we think about the, um, the torque, the overall torque due to those forces on that loop of wire. So that's the plan. So to keep it simple, 
Now, this was a circular loop. I'll come back to this. But uh, I'm going to think about a rectangular loop. And this is going to be just one loop of wire. This loop here actually had many turns of wire. So there's probably 100 turns of wire here. But here we just got one. But it's basically the same situation. Uh, we got a region of magnetic field. You see the field lines are streaming from a north pole over here on the left to a south pole over here on the right. We've kept this field nice and uniform. And then we got this loop of wire, rectangular wire. Its height is B, its width is A, and that's immersed in this magnetic field. And the way we're going to understand or think about the forces on this loop of wire is actually to think about the four forces on the four sections of the wire that make up the right rectangle. So there's a left. I call that, um, that side one. There's a right. I call that side two. And then there's a top and a bottom. And we're going to think about separately about the, the forces on the left, the right, the top, and the bottom. And we're going to think about them using the field equation, using the right-hand rule. So let, let's think, start with the left and the right. So I've indicated here that for the left-hand side, you get a force that's out of the screen. That's what this dot means. Right-hand side, you get a force that's into the screen. That's what this cross means. When this current is flowing counterclockwise around the loop. Let's check that. So firstly, there are forces on the left and right. One is out and one is in. So you would point the palm of your hand in the direction of your current. So that's downwards on the left-hand side. The field is going towards the right, so I'm curling my fingers towards the right. And my thumb is pointing towards you. So there is indeed a force out of the screen on that vertical right left-hand section of wire. On the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, the current is now flowing upwards. The field is still in towards the screen. My thumb then points the opposite direction from the left-hand side. It points some, um, oh, what am I doing? The current is going up. Sorry, I'm getting it wrong. Current is going up. The field is going towards the, um, uh, the right again. Now the uh, thumb is pointing in towards the screen. And so we've got a force on the right-hand side that's in towards the screen. We had a force on the left-hand side that's out of the screen. And so that's, that's all right-hand rule. This was right-hand rule. This is right-hand rule. If we want the sizes of those forces, on the left and right, we can just use the field equations. So this is the field equation. Force equals IL. That's the sort of thing about the wire that experiences the force. Here's the field that's carrying the force. And here's this sine theta that determines the, um, is governed by the direction between the current and the field. In this case, um, the angle between the force and the current is 90 degrees. It's 90 degrees on the left, and it's 90 degrees on the right. In this case, the length of the wire is the height of the loop, so it's going to be this lowercase b. The current is the current in the loop, which is the current i. And so we get this equation, i b, i lowercase b, that's the length of the side, times uppercase b, that's the magnetic field, is the strength of the force, f1. Same thing, I lowercase b, uppercase b is the strength of the force over here on the right-hand side. So we've managed to analyze the left-hand right -hand sides of this loop, realize that they both experience forces because they're currents in magnetic fields, realize that one's being pushed into, one's being pulled out of the screen, and realize that the strength of those forces are the same. The strength of the forces go scale as the current, more current, more force, scale as the field, more field, more force, scale as the length of the wires. The greater that rectangle's height, B, then the greater the force. So I, I lowercase b, uppercase b, is the strength of the force. Um, so those are two forces on the left and right. There's two other sides. I haven't talked about two other sides, top and the bottom. Top and the bottom are easy. So we said that there's this really weird, puzzling thing about um, uh, the forces on currents or moving charges in magnetic fields, that if you move a charge or if you have a current that flows along the direction of the magnetic field 
or flows opposite the direction of the magnetic field. We call those collinear. They're along or opposite. If you have that collinear situation, then there's actually no force. Although you're in a magnetic field, although you're a current or a move, moving charged particle in a magnetic field, you're going to experience no magnetic force because of that very special direction. So actually the top and bottom of the wires, because they're either got a current that's going in the same direction as the field or opposite direction to the field, then they experience no force whatsoever. So force top, force bottom is zero. <clears throat> so we, we've analyzed this square loop, rectangular loop in this magnetic field. And we've discovered that on one side is being um, pulled out of the screen. The other side is being pulled into the screen. What would that do? Think about what that would do to this loop. If I pull this side out, the left-hand side out, and, and push the right-hand side in. So this is a force in towards the screen. This is a force out of the screen. These forces are opposite directions on opposite sides. What it does is rotate the loop. It's going to rotate the loop. This force over here is creating what we call a torque on the loop that tends to turn the loop. This force over here is creating a torque on the loop that's going to tend to turn the loop. And those two torques will work together to rotate the loop. And that's why we saw this loop rotate in a magnetic field when we switched on the current. And so that's the explanation or the origins of the, um, uh, of the magnetic torque. Uh, here, I'm calculating the total torque on the entire loop due to the two individual torques, I call them tau one, tau two, from the the force on the left-hand side, the force on the right-hand side. So both of those forces create a, um, a torque that together add up and make the total torque. Uh, the torque that's created by a force, this is a reminder for you, because you met torques creating forces in Physics 211. You saw that to create a torque, you knew it needed a force in Physics 211. The relationship between the torque and the force is this one here. So this is the torque due to a force F. So the torque tau due to a force F is equal to the force times the distance it is acting from the axis of rotation times the sine of the angle between this force's direction and this vector R's direction. Uh, here I'm filling in that, situ that equation, the relationship between forces and torques, for my two torques on the left-hand side of the loop and the right-hand side of the loop. Um, if you look here, I'm filling in the two forces, F1 and F2, from the previous side. Um, that was uh, I, lowercase b, times uppercase b, are these two forces. I'm filling in the distance from the axis of rotation. So the distance from the axis of rotation is the distance to the center of the loop. It's half the width of the loop. It's A over 2. And I'm filling in the fact that the force... The direction of the force is perpendicular to the line from the axis of rotation to where the force is acting. So these are all the ingredients that go into forces making torques. I'm plugging in my expression for the two forces, F1 and F2, in terms of the currents in the wire, the magnetic fields that they're immersed in, et cetera, et cetera. When I do all the algebra, I'm going to go quickly here, you get this master equation here. So that the torque that's created on that loop is equal to the current that's flowing in the loop. This uppercase A is the height times the width of the loop, is the area of the loop. And this B is the magnetic field that the loop is immersed in. And so this is the calculation of, this, of the size of the torque that arose from the, those two forces that we saw were exerted on the loop intended to rotate the loop. It's, um, the size of that torque is um, I, A, B. The current in the loop, so it makes sense, more current, more torque. 
the size of the loop, the area of the loop. Probably makes sense. A bigger loop, experience more torque. Smaller loop, less torque. And the size of the magnetic field, right? More magnetic field, you get more magnetic torque. That makes sense too. So IAB makes sense in terms of how it depends on the nature, the characteristics of the loop and the current it's carrying and the field that that loop has been immersed in. Okay. This is a summary slide of that equation. So we worked that whole equation out for rectangular loop. It's interesting that that equation applies to not just to rectangular loops, but any shape of loop. So if you had a circular loop, the same equation applies. If you have a, a, a weird shape loop, same equation applies. Whether it's the rectangle, the circle, or the weird shape loop, that area A is the area of the rectangle or the circle or the weird shape loop. So that same equation, IAB, applies to all loops. Also in this equation, there's an extra n. What's the n? That's the number of turns of the loop. So um, our loop that we talked about just had one turn. But if I was to make a, um, another turn, we would get twice the torque. If I was to make three turns of that loop, I'd get three times the torque. Ten times, I'd get ten times the torque. So the more turns of the loop, the correspondingly more torque the loop will experience. So this generalizes that equation from a loop that just had one turn to a loop that has many turns, whatever number of turns n that you choose, that you pick. And then finally, this sine theta. In our case that we worked out, there was a 90 degree angle between the vector that represents the magnetic field, and the vector that represents the surface area of the loop. So we call those two vectors B and A. There was 90 degrees between those two vectors. We were looking at a special orientation of the loop in the field, or the field in, on the loop. In general, you could have different angles between the field and the loop. And so this sine theta accounts for that. Look at this little diagram over here. Here the magnetic field is towards the right, here the loop is not at right angles to that, the area vector representing the loop. It's not at right angles to that. It's at some angle theta, and that's the reason for this sine theta term. So we worked out the problem of a loop in a magnetic field and the torque on it, but we did it for a special case. We did it for a rectangular loop. We did it for uh, a single turn of loop, and we did it for a loop where its, its, field, its vector A was at right angles to the magnetic field. This equation here is the general equation when you've got any shape of loop that just has an area A. You've got any number of turns in your loop has number of turns N. And it's at any orientation in a magnetic field. Theta is the orientation of the loop in the magnetic field. So this is the general equation here. Okay, I've got a quiz question. So in this question, we're asked to think about that loop in that magnetic field, that rectangular loop in that um, uniform magnetic field. And it just asks us, what's the total force on the loop? What's the net force? What's the sum of the forces on that loop? We've talked about the total torque on the loop that's causing the loop to rotate, but what's the total force on the loop? So I'll give you a moment um, to think about that.
Okay, so to figure out the total force, you, all you've got to do is think about the individual forces and add up the individual forces. On this loop, there were two individual forces. There was one over here on the left and one over here on the right. One of them was out of the screen, one of them was into the screen. Their sizes were the same sizes, same magnitudes. So you've got two forces that are acting in this loop. One's pulling it out of the screen, one's pushing it into the screen. They're equal and opposite. Those two forces add up to zero. If you just add up the forces, they add up to zero. So there's no net force on this loop. That's why when I flip the switch, there is a net torque. It rotates, but there's no net force. It doesn't move towards you. It doesn't move away from you. The force overall, the total, the net force is zero, but there is a rotation. There is a turning. There is a torque. I'm going to finish there. There's one more example that I'll post on um, our Canvas page. But basically today, we started with the field equation, and I pointed out there's two ways of writing the field equation, either in terms of current or in terms of a moving charge. But then we focused on three different examples of forces on moving charges or electrical currents in magnetic fields. So it's all about examples, classic examples of magnetic forces. 